Well, fuck it. Yeehaw then. Great Northern Discussions. We are back and uh, super stoked. Very excited for this episode because we have a real live cowboy <laughs> with us. Uh, current 23, 2023 world champion Chuck Wagon driver, Chance Vegan. Welcome. Thanks for having me, buddy. You betcha. It's good. And uh, thanks for bringing some vino and... We got the Zins, the Kopi. You're off the Copenhagen, though. <laughs> I am off the Hagen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not good for the heart, apparently. That's the rumor. Uh, that is the rumor. I should uh, let let some people know too uh, that we also have a, a sit in guest today. I just felt like popping by to grease in on our vino and beers. Uh, Tommy McCarthy, who's a senior technical sales rep over at Step Energy Services. Welcome, buddy. Thanks for having us, guys. Looking looking forward to this. He's just going to sit in the back and get bombed. Yeah, he's my hype man, too. <laughs> <laughs> kind of quiet back area. Yeah, yeah, you keep her quiet. That's all good. You jump in anytime. We like to we like to do that. Uh, and Chance, also just for the folks, too, you're not not only are you just that, but you also uh, have been in the oil field services side too for for a long time. You work over at uh, Sundown. Energy, That's right. right. Yeah, working for a pipeline construction company in the winter time and uh-huh. do a little bit of farrier blacksmiths work. And uh-huh. when I'm not wagon racing, I think about it all the time. But I have to uh, pay some bills too. So <laughs> yeah, that guy's got to eat. That's the deal. Yeah, totally. Well, good. All right. Well, let's just let's dive right in. I thought. Um, that, I'm excited about this because, yeah, I, I mean, a, as a fan of the Stampede and uh, coming from, like, Ontario originally, I've been here 24 years now, like, in, in a row, I guess, uh, but then fell in love with the Calgary Stampede, and this, this isn't just about the Stampede, but then I fell in love with the bull riding and the saddle bronc and bareback yeah. and, of course, the chucks, which is your night show before the big grand uh, uh, show on, the, on stage there, the night event, but uh, this will be a good... Good opportunity to learn more about the sport of, of chuck race, chuck wagon racing, and uh, outrider uh, experience because you're a five time, you're a five time uh, outrider champion. That's as right, well, yeah. correct. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, we're gonna dive into all that in your past, and and we'll run through. But I thought maybe a good place to even start is before you got into it is just just the history of the sport itself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, chuck wagon racing started right here in Calgary. Yeah. And it was about 100 years ago. Mm. So, well, literally last year we celebrated the centennial year. Yeah. So a guy named Guy Wiedek basically had a traveling circus. And uh, he came to the Stampede in 1912. And then yeah. 10, 10, 11 years later, he brought wagon racing. And what chuck wagon racing was, was on the plains when you were, you know, cattle driving. The wagon was the kitchen. Right. So that's what the crew got fed out of and, and everything. And then they got bored and started racing each other. So they would go from point A to point B and whoever got smoke coming out of the wagon first is the winner of the race. The winner. <laughs> so that's the yeah. term hot cakes to high stakes because they were yeah. serving pancakes out of there. And now we're running for a little bit of money at Stampede, you know. So yeah. the history goes back a long way. So it's cool to, it's cool mm-hmm. to see the ele- evolution of the sport. And so that, um, like you mentioned, the, the hot cakes when you watch uh, events live now, um, the the outrider. The, Let's have one of those. Suckers. Yeah, have a have a. These are light. They're only three milligrams. Uh, I usually double. I actually have three in my mouth right now already. <laughs> I just double up. I'm like you. I'm getting off the the Copenhagen program. Are you? Yeah, yeah, trying. It's hard, man. It's super <clears throat> hard. But yeah, enjoy. Good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> well, we've got an hour, or so we'll put a dent in it. <laughs> Um, yeah. What was I talking about there? Oh, just, uh, yeah. Like, so, um, you mentioned the hotcakes and then the, the guys uh, that have to throw in, which is essentially a mock campfire. Right. And that's right? called the stove. So the it's stove. just like a metaphorical term. Like it's a traditional term. That's why yeah. it has to be painted red to represent fire. Okay. So the, the penalties behind that come with that, like an outrider can never win you a race, but he can definitely lose you one. Yeah. And it happens quite often. So mm-hmm. we're obviously a timed event. Timed event. And when yeah. they take penalties, they add time onto the wagon that they're riding for. Mm-hmm. So for instance, if the stove doesn't get loaded, they add two seconds onto that driver's time. Right. If the stove is off the ground when the horn blows, that's mm-hmm. an advantage for the outrider. Yeah. Then they add a second. 
Okay. And then the outriders got to turn the figure eight pattern just like the drivers do. And the, the most common penalty would be a laid outrider. Laid out. So if they're not, there's two finish lines, mm-hmm. one yep. for the driver, one for the outrider. Yep. And they've obviously got cameras on both. And then if your outriders aren't within 150 feet of you when you cross the line, they add a second. That's that's by far the most common penalty that, that our sport has. Mm-hmm. And all four have to cross the line too, no matter what, right? All four outriders? They yeah, all, well, we're, all, we're, or, we're down to two now. Down to two? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, for safety reasons, they wanted to take a few. There used to be four per wagon. Yeah. Yeah, they went down to two a few years back to get, oh, well, just to have go. less people on the racetrack. Learning already. Five minutes in the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I pushed again, I pushed back against that pretty hard. I, I'm yeah. a traditionalist. I liked it the way that it was. Yeah. But uh, the way that they saw it is if they eliminated two outriders and two horses per team, that's eight less per, per race. Okay. That it was going to be a lot safer. Mm-hmm. And they're probably not wrong, but I kind of like the chaos of it all. Yeah, for sure. Of yeah. As you would. That's where I got my start as an outrider was, was at the Stampede in a four outrider show. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I liked it like that. All of our stops now are just two outriders. So it simplified things quite a bit for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. All right. Well, so yeah, let's, let's talk about how you, how you got into it. And I, I obviously, you know, do some reading and try to figure out where you, maybe you got your start. You can tell me, but your father and your grandfather. Yeah, that's right. right? So like I said, wagon racing started a hundred years ago. My family has been in it for about 80 years. Holy shit. Yeah, so I'm third generation. My grandfather, Ralph, had a, quite a bit of success, and then my dad kind of took over from him, and same for me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the thing about wagon racing is it is a family sport. You'll see right. a lot of the same name. A lot of names are th- three generations deep, some even four. Wow. So if you see the checkerboard wagon at the Stampede, that family goes back to the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool. They, and, like, I've talked about this before. You almost... You almost got to be born into it. I, I mean, it's not, there's just so many variables and it's like, who's going to sign up to get into a wagon and hook four thoroughbreds and I'm going to go and try that. First of all, it's like a no. huge investment. Yeah. Second of all, it can be super dangerous and mm. there's just a lot of moving parts to get into it full time. It's not an easy sport to get into. No. It's hard to get out of because it's easy to fall in love with it. Once you understand it in the least bit, it's yeah. extremely exciting. Um, I it's think in that's your blood. It's in yeah, your blood, literally. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. That's the deal. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have, uh, oh, Tommy, we've got a flag here. Flag, flag on the play. Let's touch, touch a little more about your, uh, grandfather though, Viggs, say hey? just, just how good he was and, and how yeah. inspirational to you he is, you know? Yeah. The thing about Ralph is he took a much different path. Like, so he, after winning his first Calgary stampede, he sold out. Because back then, if somebody came with a check, you sold. It wasn't, it wasn't a profession. It was more of a hobby. Yeah. And a lot of those guys were just cowboys. Nobody was making a bunch of money. Not that we are nowadays. But well, we uh, talk we, about that, too. Yeah, yeah, we make enough to make a living now. But back then, it was, it, there was a lot of guys that just did it out of the pure love of the game. Yeah. And where Ralph gets a lot of his respect is after he sold out, a guy named Kelly Sutherland brought him on as a contract mm-hmm. driver. Mm-hmm. And he was tasked with teaching Kelly Sutherland how to drive and Kelly would provide him with second and third string horses and Ralph would go on to beat a lot of guys for a lot of years right. driving horses that Kelly, who's widely regarded as the best driver of all time and he's certainly the most decorated. Mm-hmm. And so when the guy that's won the most pays the most respect to somebody, a lot of people pay attention to that. And so that guy was Ralph Vegan and is for a lot of drivers, including myself. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. If uh, guys are uh, getting the nod from guys like that. Exactly. You, um, so you grew up then in, in Grand Prairie yeah. in that area. And so, yeah, when was the first foray? Obviously you grew up around it, so you're seeing it all the time. Um, when was the first foray into and what were you doing? Well, ever since I was a little kid, my dad was out riding. Yeah. And then my mom was really big into the quarter horse world. So we showed, and that consisted of, uh, equitation, Western pleasure, reigning. We showed horses on that side of things. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I was 15 and I was tall enough to reach the horn, my dad started teaching me how to outride. Yeah. And I got into my first race here at 15 years old. So, yeah, we always had horses. And my mom, she was uh, the summer games coach for the equestrian team for Team Alberta. Mm-hmm. She was 
probably the best horseman out of all of us, to be honest. Yeah. And my dad was kind of like a, a real aggressive guy. So when you mold that from your parents, it was it was a good way to grow up and it was a good way to learn about horses and it was a good way to, to catch on to the sport at a young age. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky that I had a lot of people that backed me. Kelly Sutherland gave me a shot really quickly. He did it. Eh? Yeah, yeah, and then once I started riding for Kelly Sutherland, all the other rides fell fell to me because once you're riding for the guy that's on top, everybody else is willing to give you a shot if that guy is. Yeah. So because that my family was connected to Kelly, it, it paid dividends for me down yeah. the road, right, when I got my shot. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. that's kind of how the, how, the, how the world works, right? You, you know somebody or you, get, you got an in. I mean, you got to use your whatever angle you can. That's right. Don't matter. It's yeah. who you know sometimes. Who you know, yeah. yeah. I tell that to the kiddos all the time trying to get jobs and stuff like that. Does it, does, you can have a good resume and you can be the best at it. It doesn't mean you're getting in, right? It helps to know somebody. What do you have, Tommy? Beaks, you always talk about um, the hands. You, you, you talk about Ralph had very good hands, and uh, I think that's where you've, got, you've gotten your hands from your grandfather too. We talk about that all the time. That's such a big component of the sport. A big part of it. It's yeah. huge, yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing about, like, even when I was out riding, I never understood driving. You, it's like fighting. Yeah. Like when you watch the UFC, you – you see fighting, but you don't really know fighting yeah, until you, you actually understand. go and spar, and you're like, mm -hmm. wow, there's way more, way more going on than what I thought. Sure. That's kind of what driving is, because the only communication I have to the four horses is down the line. Yeah. So those lines are like, they're like telephone cables. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm communicating to four at once, and it's every mm -hmm. horse's mouth has got a different level of sensitivity. Yeah. So you can't drive them all the same, and when you're moving, it's hard to... It's all in the hands. All in the hands. Yeah, yeah. and you don't really notice it when you're watching it as a viewer. You just think like you're you're turning a figure eight pattern and you know yeah, you're going just, for broke yippee ki yay. It looks but, like you're just kind of pulling and, and right. There's a lot more to it. But every horse has a different sensitivity in the mouth, and it's good if you can feel each each mouth with it again. Like I'm terrible at explaining it because it's a no. feel thing, right? Yeah. So for over the years, repetition, some guys get it and some guys don't. And some people yeah. like Ralph just seem to, it didn't, that's why you can see a driver get into, sometimes when a driver, another driver gets injured yeah. and he needs a replacement driver, yeah. a guy can get in there and do a lot better or a lot worse, mm -hmm. even though they're driving the same horses. Yeah. Right. And that's strictly on some guys really have a feel for the mouths and, and not checking them too hard. And they just mm. can communicate down the line a little bit better. And that's just, I just think something, some things you can practice and some things you just seem to have. And I think that you need a combination of both. Combination of I both. I think so, yeah. 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 And so on your, uh, your straps, uh, do you call them straps? Or just lines? call them lines. On your lines. Yeah. Do you have like two on each side or is there different in, in or is it just one line on each side? I'm no, just, there's sounds so, like a silly question. No, it's all good. It's four separate lines. So it is four separate lines. So on top okay. in my hands, I have yeah. the front two horses and those are called the leaders. Okay. So I have, I control my lead team with my top two fingers mm -hmm. and then down low I have my wheel team. And so those are the horses directly behind. Okay. So I keep both right horses in my right hand, both left horses in my left hand, but mm -hmm. the, they're doing different things from front doing to back. Things. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Like, like, a, like a drummer on wheels. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, that's pretty wild. Interesting. Okay, so it, you're, let, let's talk about your outriding years then and then your first getting in. And, like, you were a rookie. Yeah. You were a, a champion rookie. Or you call it a champion? A rookie. Rookie of the year. Rookie of the sure. year, 2001. Uh, Holy man, that's a long time ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anybody remember what they were doing in 2001? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I was out riding, but that's going back a ways. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Out riding was something that I always grew up wanting to do. So like I said, yeah. er, like when I would go to the races, I, you, your dad's your hero when you grow up, right? Of course. And so when you're watching your dad compete and he's an outrider and Mike had quite a bit of success. I grew up putting a whip in my back pocket, walking around like those guys when I was really little, right? But those yeah. are my heroes weren't hockey players and basketball players. They were they were outriders and wagon drivers. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I was a bit of a late bloomer, so I could never get to the I couldn't reach the horn to jump on. Right. So if you've watched it, like you got to get on on the fly, and yeah. yeah, I couldn't reach the horn. So by the time I turned fifteen, I was just getting tall enough, and my dad gave me my shot here at at the Calgary Stampede. He it. It came at a cost because he, he had to fire three people up one night. He had a really big debacle behind there, and everybody messed up. And 
he threw me in on day seven here, and that's how I got my shot. That's I never, how you got your shot. I how old were you that year then? Were Fif- you, 15 you, years old, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thrown right in there. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's the best way to learn, and sometimes yeah. it's not. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it worked out for me, thankfully, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I was pretty nervous to do it, to be honest. Like, I'd be lying to say, like, it was my idea. It was my dad's idea. Yeah. He was like, get in there and go. Because I wasn't even sanctioned. Like, on our tour, on the WPCA tour, you have to get sanctioned to mm-hmm. go out there. You can't just, like, decide you're going to go out into the arena one day. No. So you yeah, get yeah. judged and you get graded. And if you pass your simulation races, they'll grant you your, your pro card, right? Okay. But Calgary being an exhibition, you can't. back then you could quite literally go out there. You could go out and outride. You can just go. Which sounds crazy now. It's not like that now. You have to be carded. But back then, there was no affiliation from the Stampede to the WPCA or the CPCA. They had their own rules. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have a sanctioning committee to take care of the outriders if they wanted to get started. So they just let anybody ride. Yeah. And they knew that no driver would put any outrider out there because this is the biggest money show we have, right? So typically, it was only for experienced guys anyways. But Mm. no, you didn't need to be sanctioned. So it was a little bit more Wild West. Like you said, that's 24 years ago. a long time ago. Yeah, Yeah. well, everything has changed since then, yeah. Big time. How was the purse? How was the purse back then comparatively? Do you remember what it would have been back then? Yeah, I do. Like the day money's... So the the purse structure per day has gone way up. Yeah. But uh, one thing, and again, I've been a little bit vocal about this, is the, the winner is making 50 grand you do get a truck for the to keep yeah which which i suppose is i don't know worth about 100 nowadays but when my grandfather won it in uh the last time he won it was 1985 Mm -hmm. he got 50 grand to win it like that's a long time ago and a long time that would have been big uh, yeah like a bale of hay was 50 cents right (laughs) and now it's 15 dollars yeah. Like you could buy a really good horse for $2,000. And now when these mm-hmm. guys have their dispersal sales, so when guys retire, they typically have an auction after the stampede. Mm-hmm. And you, you need 30 to 40 grand to buy a wagon horse. Right. Just to give you the context, right? So yeah. I'd like to see them bring up the, the prize money for the winner mm-hmm. and not just have so much of a, like I call it a bit of a socialistic purse structure. Yeah. Where, you know, they're really divvying it out to everybody. Right. But that turns into participation. Yeah, ribbon. and thanks we, for coming. <laughs> we do too much of that as a society already, in oh, my yeah. opinion. You need to, you need to incentivize success. So I would like to see them like up things for the guys that are the champions. Yeah, true champion. Here's your big winnings. And, and that was my story. opinion when I when I was getting my ass kicked. I still stood by that. You still stood by. Yeah. That. Yeah. Sure. Well, that that makes sense. I th- yeah. I was gonna. I think we'll get into some. I was gonna ask you about yeah the operation side as well. Uh, what do you? Yeah. That's the one thing, though, being sued, not everybody understands. So when you see that check raised over your head, mm-hmm. it's, it's false on, on the whole entire tour. It's like it's showing you a number. Well, yeah. Calgary's is uh, Calgary's is fifth. It is what it is. But they, they pay everybody out in the in the final heat. So it's like 50, 30, 20, 25, 20 or something like that. Right. And they do add the truck in and the prize money for the days, like the day rates have gone up. Mm-hmm. But I just think that if you're... I love the Calgary Stampede, yeah. but if you're the greatest outdoor show on earth and and that's that kind of part be, of their brand, be, yeah. you yeah. need to, like, for instance, down the road at Pinoca, the the winning dash is 75000 mm. right? And that's... Yeah, and how is it bigger there? Yeah. Like, this is the biggest outdoor show on earth. Like, nobody in Australia will know, and I love the Pinoca Stampede as well. It's one of the bigger rodeos in North America, but yeah. nobody in Australia is going to know about the Pinoca Stampede, but they'll know about... The they Calgary, the Calgary. Stampede. Yeah. So they want to come for exposure maybe more because it's a big show, but really your per- your bigger purse is straight north up the road. Yeah. So I'd like huh. to see them just up things for the for the champion. Yeah. Just because if you're, if you're the greatest outdoor show on earth, like it should mean just like a little bit more, but I'm yeah. a little bit biased, obviously. So. Well, no, I, I feel like just as a fan uh, and then knowing buddies of buddies who ride or, <clears throat> or saddle bronc or whatever they do, I've been hearing it for, I feel like ever since I moved here, I've, it's like they get you get your big pay, then they go back and pay your expenses on the year. Not not everyone, but yeah. it's, you get this check, and then you pay your expenses on the year, and then you go back out and ride again, and then you maybe win, and then you pay your – like, what's your op, your operating cost? Overhead's huge. Overhead's got to be massive. Yeah, that's where the advertising money is crucial. Yeah. Yeah, so for those who don't know, the canvas on my wagon, that'll go to auction in, what, two weeks, yeah, Tommy? Two weeks' time. Yeah. yeah. April 11th, yep. 
And those are what are those going for these days? I mean, it's the it's, high bid is usually bid. around two hundred thousand. Two hundred, yeah, yeah. And the average would probably be around a hundred. Yeah, yeah. But for me, I can run a pretty light ship. I do a lot of things myself, so like I, I take care of a lot of farrier work. I try to do a, everything that I know how to do myself instead of outsourcing it. Yeah, but that can wear you out too because. Come April 15th to the beginning of September, like there's no breaks. Right. So this is, yeah, this is right around the corner. Like you're, you're in, you're, you're getting in shape right now to hit, hit the road. That's right. So, but without the advertising dollars, the, the prize money isn't strong enough to maintain 25 equine athletes over the course of, well, it's a year round thing, but the costs obviously go up during competition. But mm-hmm. yeah, without that, the advertisers, backing the athletes and the equine yeah. athletes we wouldn't be able to do it no it wouldn't make sense yeah 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 you have to have that sponsorship 100 money to keep you going that's um that's the one thing you know talk that nobody yep. nobody knows about vegs he mm-hmm. shoes his own horses man so you go to the back of the barns mm-hmm. and you know this guy's balls at the walls 24 yeah. 7 you know other guys have other people to shoe their horses right. most guys do as as i'm you know, understand it. So yeah. maybe, maybe touch on, you went to school for that Vegs a long time ago, right? Well, I, I was, yeah, I was going to ask you about, um, get into the treatment of the animal side, yeah, mm-hmm. what it takes and the care and the money. So, you know, Tommy just mentioned, yeah, you went to school. Yeah. yeah. I, I encourage everybody to come down to my barn, like mm-hmm. as many people as possible. So Where's what, it at? Well, during, during competition. Oh, during your barn yeah. down there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So like, obviously we can only do so much with so many passes that were allocated, but my advertisers typically are blown away because the horses are just, they're treated like Kings back there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're the number one priority between all of us, me, my wife, my crew, mm-hmm. my entire team. We always put the horses first. So with that comes a cost, like everything's gone up. Well, in this whole country, everything's gone up in the last, however yeah. many years, Bonkers. maybe since 2015, <laughs> it's getting a little out of hand. Yeah. It's, yeah 14, 15. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it is, it is extremely expensive to take 25 horses down the road for three and a half months. Is that, is that how many you would take? 25? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. I had no idea. I would have, I would have, I'm just thinking like other uh, sports. It's very, rosters, it's but. very similar to, you know, your hockey. Yeah. It's very similar to running a hockey franchise. Okay. So you need depth in the lineup. Sure. Right. You got four yeah. lines and mm-hmm. three sets of D. Well, we're pretty similar. I've got four hmm. outfits and about seven out riding horses, depending on the year. Yeah. And what happens is I typically have an outfit that's really good at certain barrels. Right. So barrel one has got a, its own angle and its own distance. It's a tougher angle. Yeah. And it's a longer distance, but it's closest to the rail. So it's typically the barrel that guys win off of most. Mm-hmm. But I have a certain outfit of, of horses, four horses for that barrel, and a completely different one over here on barrel on the outside barrels, right. which are easy angles and shorter distance, but further away from the rail. So some mm-hmm. horses excel in different situations and it's your job to figure out like where they belong. Just like, Who's good at what? Just like a yeah. hockey team, guys sure. kill penalties and some are on the power play and you find out what everybody's strengths are. And then it's up to you to, you know, place them where they should that's be. That's right. Where you yeah. think they should be. What's the kind of the prime or optimal age for, for a horse to, to yeah. race or or even between out riding and and pulling like there, there's a difference there got to be right for sure typically the horses that get put in the out riding pen are the ones that didn't work on the wagon because okay. the out riding horses need to be a lot more calmer and docile because there's a man holding them on the ground he's starting on the ground and he's got to get on that horse right yeah so you don't want them too aggressive which is the opposite of the wagon we want them going 100 miles an hour. Yeah. So the good wagon horses would never be able to make an outriding horse. Like, they'd never be able to get on them, right? Okay. So, yeah, we're just looking for aggression. And to answer your question about, like, placing them, the front two horses that we call the leaders, they take a lot longer to develop than the back two. Okay. So most horses will start out on the wheel because they've got a horse in front of them to follow. So patterning them is quite a bit easier. Yeah. When you have a lead team, that's your steering wheel. They need Mm. to know the pattern, and sometimes that takes a lot of reps. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they got to get in so many races before they're comfortable belonging in that front two position. Because the thing about practicing, like if you want to be a good golfer, you can go and get a 1,000 balls from the range and swing away until your hands get sore. But with wagon racing, we have to monitor how 
intense our workouts are. Yeah, you so don't if, overwork them. You can't. Right? Yeah, because yeah. if you work them too hard, they'll start to not like what they're doing. Right. Right? It's like yeah. anybody doing anything. You don't want to overdo it or you, you'll get sour of it. Mm. So I don't drive my broke horses very much. I just get them in shape and I okay. keep them hungry to get out there. Yeah. If I went, I'm just turn barrels constantly. After a while, I wouldn't even get to the top barrel and they'd start turning without me. Right. It's like the yeah. horses are, they they're not, interest, yeah, they yeah. do funny things on you. And we've learned mm -hmm. that like over time, you can only get away with practicing so much a certain way. Yeah. So I don't, actually don't turn a lot of barrels, yeah. which isn't good for the driver because that's your key that's time your, to practice. That's your practice. Right. Yeah. But it can be a detriment to the horses if you overdo it. So when it's we do, line. yeah, when we hook up, we're, yeah. we can only go so fast and so far, and then we got to come back to the barn. So it kind of limits how much you're able to practice, if you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. And how long would, uh, like, a career, I know we're talking about the horse now, just because I'm curious. Yeah. How, how long w would their career be, typically? Yeah. Does it just depend? I mean, it you does. just kind of gauge them, like they're starting to wear down. It does. Every horse is different. But, like, mm -hmm. we've started some at four and retired them at 17. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if as long as you've got wow. the... Yeah, it, that's pretty long. Yeah, as long as you got the power on the wheel, on the wheel team, the mm -hmm. leaders will last a really long time mm -hmm. running. They can, keep, they can keep up. They start to slow down, I think, around, like, 13, 14, you start to notice, like, they maybe don't have as much uh, pop on the horn and maybe not finishing quite as fast, but they're yeah. still very effective. Still very effective. Yeah. yeah. But the, the older they get, the more time you end up saving in the barrels lots of times because they're really accustomed to the pattern. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to steer them as much because every time you steer, you slow down. Right. Same as yeah, driving you your car. Sure. Yeah. Anytime you steer, you're slowing down. So I try to restrict the horse's mouths and whatnot as little as possible. Mm. But when you're going fast, that's easier said than done. Like it's, your instinct is to check sometimes, and yeah. sometimes you got to stay out of their way a little bit, and it can go against everything that your intuition is telling you to do, because mm. it can be uncomfortable sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask one last question on the horses, just because I think people would want to know. Yeah, for sure. Where so? Where do they go after they're done their career? When when you decide this guy's had enough, what, do you keep them? Do you sell them off? How does that work? Yeah, horses? a lot of them get retired to girls that want to start out riding and want to jump. Okay. Yeah. So thoroughbreds are really good for that. They're really good for jumping, mm -hmm. and it's really good for girls to get their start. The jumping world is super expensive. Mm. So sometimes for, I shouldn't say just girls, sometimes for jumpers to get their start, they can't really afford a, a made horse. Yeah. They go for pretty large. So a lot of our horses will just get retired to, to those girls that want to start jumping. And a lot of the horses just retire on guys' farms. Right. Yeah, when they start to back off and a horse is giving you, you know, however many good years of competition, they're like a family member. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. I'll always look after them till the day they die on our it's land. Like, they're not tight. going in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get pretty close because there's no days off, right? Like, you're around them a lot. Yeah. To the point where you can kind of decipher who's who in the zoo when they're walking around in the dark. They get their own personalities. They, they and, really yeah. do. And I can tell you who's going to eat how much and what will be left in the feed bucket every morning on yeah. each horse. They, they really have their own programs. So the key in being a horseman is, is knowing each horse as an individual. Yeah. You can't, and same as a hockey team, you can't treat everybody the same because yeah. they're not the same. No. And either horses are like that too. They've got their own... Uh, They've got their own things about their quirks and you got to figure out what makes them tick. Yeah. And that's part of the fun is, is figuring that all out. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. My job is to get the best out of each horse. And if that means he's better on the left than the right, I got to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They got their own. Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're your family. Yeah. They're literally your family. For sure. Do you ever. Just, uh, as we're leaving the horses yeah. here, the one the one thing uh, worth mentioning, I think, Viggs is not many people would know that, that I learned was um, a lot of these thoroughbreds, they're, they're jockeyed horses, right? They can't support weight anymore, right? Maybe just touch on that before we go away from the horses. That's yeah. that's important. Yeah, I'll yeah. typically buy my horses out of Kentucky or California. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were half million dollar, million dollar horses at one point, right? As soon as they get a leg injury where they can't pack the weight of a jockey, Mm -hmm. they're they're obsolete to that game. They'll never pack weight. And the cool part about what we do is pulling weight is really easy on the horses in comparison to packing weight. It is. Okay. So it's like if, if I asked you to pack me 100 yards, yeah. piggyback me or put me in a wheelbarrow, 
you pick the wheelbarrow every time, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm never gonna. I'm never going to have the same challenges as the guys at the racetrack with the, when they're packing the weight of the jockey. So once those tendons or, uh, you know, suspensories get sore on them, they'll never be able to pack weight. I give them a year off and I'll have them for 10 years. So a lot of the horses that you're seeing in a chuck wagon race were actually, some of them are running the Kentucky Derby. I've got a few that ran in the Breeders' Cup. At one point, they were worth quite a bit of dough. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's what you're looking for. So you're, you've got a lot of horsepower in front of you. Mm. You know what I mean? If yeah. you're going to buy a sound horse off the racetrack, you're going to be looking at, you know, 5,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks. Some guys go as high as 20, mm. depending on what everybody's budget is. But uh, for me, my target is to always find a retired horse that just had an injury of some sort. That's not going to affect him in, in my game. Yeah. I we like have to it. travel a long way for him. Crazy. I don't, yeah, I just love it. I love everything about the sport. It's All the fast horses are in the States. Are they? Yeah, like the Mech Why is, is that? Uh, just history. Like history. they have a longer history of right. horse racing. So the Mech is Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Even the Japanese, the Aussies, Europeans, they'll go to Kentucky to buy horses. Yeah. It's the Mecca of the world. And when they don't make it there, they go <laughs> they go inward so florida california kentucky are the best and then as they w make their way north uh those are the ones that are a little bit slower than the rest of them <laughs> yeah well that's a, that's all right for trips yeah head down to florida you know bring bring back uh how many how many would you pick up at a time or are you just like you're, well, you're, ho you're hoping to find one or you that can that's the challenge is you go down there and you can take a six horse trailer and come back with two come back with two yeah, yeah. sure you just never know yeah because so, Sometimes it's just not what you're looking for. Sometimes what's available down there. Yeah. It's like signing a hockey player. You don't just sign them just to sign them. If you don't get what you want, sometimes you got to wait till next year. You got to wait. Yeah. Cause with every horse you buy, it comes with a cost, right? So when you're yeah. managing your uh, year long budget, the numbers, it can add up to maintain an animal. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to purchase one just to purchase one. If he doesn't kind of check off the boxes for what I'm looking for. Yeah. If I go down with a six horse trailer, like I said, and I only get two, that's, that is what it is. I'd rather do that than just buy a, a bunch that I don't really. Yeah. I'm B, not, B squad. That's that right. Kind of thing. Well, I did, I'm glad we focused a little bit on the horse because it's a big, big part of your. It's the uh, biggest part. Team. It's <laughs> yeah. The biggest it's the part, most important so. part by far. Okay. And I do. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you there. It makes total sense, but I want, I do want to get back into. So now your career and the outriding before you got into like chuck racing. So in those, you know, you were a rookie your first year, but in those first, uh, how many years did you outride before you, before you hopped behind the wagon? I can't, 10? At least that, no. Yeah, like, yeah at longer? least that, maybe least 15. That. And so just your experiences alone as an outrider, you must have seen some insane shit. Like what, have you seen, uh, it's a dangerous sport. Sure. It's a super dangerous sport, and people can, can of course, die. Um, it doesn't happen that often, mm -hmm. but what, what's... Uh, I always said you could die crossing the road, too. True. Right? So we're all vulnerable yeah. in some respect. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Outriding was just something that I always wanted to do. It was... Yeah. The, the cool part was, is I was exposed to about six, 7,000 races. Mm. So you can kind of learn how a race is going to develop... You know, when you're on the outside barrels and you don't get the rail, like you got to get down there somehow really quickly. Yeah. And that involves a lot of polling and uh, what you call drafting, like a lead runner. I don't know how to quantify it. It's never been done, but uh, like in track and field, the lead runner is going to exert 8% more energy than the one drafting behind him. Yeah. Just like in car racing, like right. you're, you're trying to get behind and then make your move on a turn. Or, yeah. And it yeah. still applies to us. So I just yeah. kind of learned a lot about that, a lot about track variants. I, I really pay attention to the racetrack mm -hmm. because sometimes depending on the venue that's doing the harrowing, there can be certain lanes that are a little bit harder than others. Yeah. So before the races, I like to, to walk the track and find out where the hard spots are. Wherever the hard spots are, your wheels are going to roll easier, okay. right? Just simple yeah. physics, right? Sure. Like you're always looking for the best lanes. So sometimes when you're behind, mm -hmm. you don't really have the option. But when you get out in front of everybody, like I can dictate where I want to run. So yeah. if I've done my homework and I know where the hard spots are, like I'm going to find them because I can kind of choose my lane, right? Yeah. That's super important. Okay. Yeah. yeah, see, yeah, definitely wouldn't have thought of that either. And in the rain, you know, the, the track is banked, so when it rains, all the moisture will go to the rail. So mm. 
we're all trying to get to the rail all the time because it's the shortest way around the track. But when, sure. when the track gets moisture, the rail can actually be the worst spot. So that's the last place you want to be because, you know, all the water will build up there It'll and it's, up. yeah, it's harder to pull so your wagon through. Hydroplaning and yeah, harder to pull through. Yeah. So track variance is a big part of it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And so what made you decide when you, did you always want to be like, you loved out riding, you loved horses, you're born into the family. Did you, did you have racing on your mind? Like you wanted to be behind that wheel or what got you in behind? All I wanted to do was wagon race. I wanted, wanted to be, wagon yeah, race. Okay. I wanted to so be in waiting for your opportunity kind of thing. Yeah. I okay. was just getting tall enough to reach the horn. Yeah. That's all I cared about. Okay. And as soon as I, I was, I dropped everything else that I was doing and I just trained at that discipline. And that was it. So That's, what was, so how was your first race? How did the, how did you feel? I still that? remember it clear as day. There was about. 5,998 that I don't remember, <laughs> but you remember your yeah. first one and your last one and you remember the wins obviously. Right. But yeah. the first one was nerve wracking. Cause again, I wasn't even sanctioned to be out there mm. back then. You didn't need to be. Yeah. And it's not a lot of guys start at the Calgary stampede. No. It's, it's a place for people that are uh, experienced, mm -hmm. accomplished. You have to qualify to run there as a driver. Yeah. Not a lot of drivers are riding rookie outriders at that show. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's not a place for rookies to start. So I was pretty nervous about that. And I was a nervous kid because that's what I wanted to do. So I'd been think I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah. But looking back, it's the, sometimes you need a kick in the ass from someone and just, you just got to do it. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm all about that. Yeah. yeah. For sure. You need to be thrown right into the fucking. It was fire, the best right? thing that my dad could have did. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good for him. Recognizing you're ready. Just um, before we leave the Outrider stuff, so, Tuck, we're sitting around. We're sitting around a pub one day. Me and V's yeah. been buddies five, six years, right? Yeah, yeah. Bunch of pints deep, as you would, an afternoon. And I'll never forget it. He's like, Tom, did I ever tell you the time about, which which I think is a real real cool Outrider story, right? And uh, I'm like, no, bud, you didn't. You never told me about that time, and I'm surprised you've never ever told me about that time. So, why don't uh, why don't we, we touch on that, which is one of the, the coolest things I've ever seen in in the wild wild west. If you if you want to want to go there before we yeah. get off the outrider oh, stuff, yeah, do it. Yeah, it was wild one. Yeah, let's see. Are you pulling it up, or do you want me to just? I go? can uh, I can pull it up. Yeah, it's, up to you. I mean, um, yeah, this thing made, uh, uh, and Tommy did bring it to my attention. I'm sure I saw it in the past, but. Uh, Basically, you can you can run us through what happened here, but this is like wild, literally wild west shit. They're, one of the drivers actually fell out of his wagon, and for anybody that's listening, we're just going to pull it up on the screen here. Indiana and, Jones type shit. Yeah, this is Indiana Jones stuff. So this I got the volume off, but um, so this is a Kaylee's tarp. I don't know who. Uh, 2007. Well. So this is 2007. This is, I mean, you became, this was folklore. This became, you became a legend after this. Yeah. Much. So I'm riding for Kelly Sutherland here on barrel, barrel three. Yeah. When yeah. A guy named Tyler Helming and uh shout out to him. He lost his wife last weekend. I just got the, the news, but I rode for Tyler quite a bit. This particular race I was riding for, um, for Kelly Sutherland okay. and Tyler fell out of his wagon on the first turn. And there was a couple outfits pulled up on the first turn. But his wagon's going on a runaway without a pilot yeah. around the track. Uh, I, th and I think you can, uh, it's going to come up right here. Well, they're, they're going to zoom in on you. So basically, there's no driver right here. Yeah, so he gets crushed, and he's, he's having a dirt nap on the, on the first turn. <laughs> so we want to dodge him and the outfits that are pulled up on the first turn. But yeah. what, what happens with thoroughbreds is they're, they're trained to go to the rail at all times they know it's the shortest distance and it's the distance it's the, so they're all cutting in it's the lane that they're always yeah. trying to get to so i wanted to run that wagon down and if i could get in keep them away from the rail keep them away from tyler make sure they didn't hit or run over anybody yeah i think they're so right there here, here you are here yeah well, well you know what they're gonna zoom in just i did watch it so here they're zooming in look at this right here yeah so right there you got one sh <laughs> you're diving you are diving to the other there's no driver and you're diving in the back how so yeah what was going through your mind right there? no idea so to be honest with you i kind of run into the back of tyler on the first turn and i watched him fly out so i had the best view of all that yeah and so i knew he was 
piled up and I didn't want his own team to come back and run him over so I wanted to get control of his outfit yeah but the only way to do that is to get in to get in and, and, and did he was he seriously hurt did you say yeah big time he was he was hurt yeah he was never quite the same after that I, oh. he retired shortly afterwards he ran on our b circuit up north a little bit but yeah. eventually he sold out he he was a big guy and when that track's banked like that he was skipping like a rock on water up the up the racetrack yeah for a big guy like you don't just get up from so he, that yeah shattered bones and everything else i'm sure so here Okay, so you get in, you get into the back of the wagon, and then you're scurrying up the back under the tarp. I'm assuming, right? And what most guys do, like I said, you've got your four lines. Lots yeah. of times they tape them into the bottom of the box, so if you ever drop one, it's there for you to pick up. Okay. When he fell out of the wagon, he launched out. He death gripped the lines, and he took them all with him. Oh. But I didn't know that. So when I run the wagon down and I jump in, yeah. I'm thinking there's four lines taped into the bottom of the box that I, and I knew I'd learned how to drive at this point of my life. So I was going to pick up the lines and <laughs> steer through what was going on on the first turn. But when I got in, there was no there was lines at there. all. So now I'm kind of in one, right? Yeah. So now, yeah. So this is when it really goes sideways. Not only do you dive in the back, then, then <laughs> you got to shimmy up the middle of these. I don't know. Who's this guy here? That's my oh, old oh, man. Oh, that's your old man. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Handsome. Look at the locks. <laughs> right? Just good flow. Just old school. Old school flow. So in between Look the... how young you are there. Yeah, baby. just a pup. Yeah. So you can see where my foot's going? Yeah. That's called the pole. So that's what okay. connects the, the back two wheelers to the wagon. Okay. Right? And then the lead team is an extension of the pole. Yeah. So that pole is getting held up by the back two horses. Okay. And for me to get up there, I need to get to the horse's head so I can steer them. Right. And if I don't get up to their heads, I'm, I've got zero control. So you're, yeah, you've got to shimmy up the middle of the Cause the lines guys. are gone. They're, they're, they're gone. That's this right. is why you're doing this. Yeah. Okay. So you, yeah. And they, they're showing you right now, you're trying to shimmy up. Oh, then they just click to the end here. Let's see. I'll run it out and see if we, uh, oh, there you are. Right. Well, now you're in the front. So, we got to get out. Here we are here. So you're going out. And what, how, what's the speed of this? Like what, how, what's the top speed for, for horses? Do you think, or, or how do you fast do you think? Well, a lot is? of guys GPS said, I don't, but it yeah. like, you're probably topping out at 70. 70. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty fast. It's like hanging on the outside of a car on the highway. And that, that part right. where I got in is yeah. just where they start to decline in speed a little bit, but they're still going <laughs> Mock chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're still still honking on it. And so then, and so you actually, and so you you get in, you save this. Essentially, you potentially save people's lives because it could have been a wreck. It could have been a lot worse for sure. Right. And I yeah. know you weren't, you just reacted. Yeah, but. you don't have a lot of time because, I mean, a wagon race is going to go down in a minute and 15 seconds. Yeah. Right. And by the time Tyler had gotten thrown out, mm -hmm. we were already you know, probably 30 seconds in, maybe 20. Yeah. So you got a minute to, you got a minute to run them down, get in, yeah. and then figure out what to do when you don't have any lines. You don't have a lot of time. It's like uh, the end of every Mission Impossible and you got to defuse the bomb or and that, MacGruber. <laughs> that might have been a good thing in hindsight because mm -hmm. you don't have time to think about what the hell's going on right now. You're just reacting. Yeah. Yeah, there you are there. But we got through it. We got through it, and we, when we got around everybody, uh, another outrider come and jumped off his horse onto the lead team, and we turned him, and everything went back to the barn, and one, everything was good. And Tyler was obviously banged up, but he could have, he could have been a lot worse. Oh, could too. have, yeah, it could have been fatal for sure. And I think, I think they show uh, this is a CBC clip. People can find it on YouTube. But here, are you guys riding back in, uh, right after, I guess, the incident. How old were you here, do you think? Look like you were 14. 23. 23. And here, who's this here? So this is... That's my buddy Rio. So I was screaming at him going down the home stretch because you start to get tired. Because this yeah. was heat nine. So a guy, I had already rode eight heats yeah. prior to this one. Mm -hmm. So then when you're, you're tired by the time this race starts, so to run him down, get in, and then when you're balancing, you're not, a lot, you're not breathing a lot. 
Yeah. It's like when you're boxing, when you're getting punched, you don't typically breathe, so you can get more tired taking the shots than giving them. This is similar to that. When you're scared and you're tense, you're not you're not breathing. You're not breathing, yeah. So you're exhausted. So now I'm on that that pole that's moving around. It's not, you know, steady because the horses are moving it. Well, you got nothing to hang on to either. I'm just hanging on to the harness, to the harness on the horse's on the backs. Lines running up the side. Yeah, yeah, which is just little pieces of leather because we keep, we keep the harness really light. Yeah. Everything we want is built for speed, so it's not your typical work team harness. It's as light as we can get it, right? Yeah. Everything is as light as we can get it, with the exception of the wagon. It has to weigh a certain a certain amount. It's got to weigh 1,325 pounds. Okay. You can be over, but you're not allowed to be under. So we're all, you know, running an equal-weighted wagon. Yeah. And that, that stove, too, that's that's weighted as well, is it not? Or is it like, it's, or Yeah, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. It, it's it, irrelevant? Yeah, okay. it's like 5, 10 pounds. It's not, but it has to be? Or yeah, it does have to be. Yeah, it, it used to weigh fifty pounds. Oh wow! Back oh, in the so day, you had to have the big boys. You did chucking this thing, and some guys couldn't get it in because if your wagon really starts and you're yeah. throwing fifty pounds, and then again for safety reasons, the stove is like deflatable rubber and it it doesn't weigh much. Right. Like so, if a horse ran over it, he wouldn't even, it wouldn't bother him. He would well, just it wouldn't bother yeah. him. Yeah. Okay. So, did you want to add something there, Tommy? I think you look like you want to yap. Yeah, I know. I just, um, you hit the nail on the head there, Doc. It was like yeah. the, I don't, what could have went down there if Viggs didn't get in the back of that wagon for once? He makes that jump and mm-hmm. he comes up short. We, we know what, what can happen there. But if he doesn't get control of, of that outfit, then uh, th- there could have been a lot of casualties. It could have been really bad. And that's on, on, the, on the big the big show, the main stage, a lot of eyes too. Not that you want it to happen anywhere, but, um, mm. but but um, he got a real special. He won't tell you. He's humble, but uh, once you touch on the uh, the award that you received, um, I think which is r- really cool. But hey, did I ever yeah. tell, did I ever tell you about the story? Yeah. So I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna bring up bring that up. You, cool. Yeah, you were awarded for sure. I mean, it was a pretty a pretty high honor. Big yeah, team. I didn't even know that existed, but it's called the Governor General. Yeah. So it's just like a like a governor general certificate of like merit of bravery. Yeah. So yeah, it was cool. So I was living in Grand Prairie back then, and the governor general wrote a letter to our mayor, who was my high school basketball coach. Oh no way! Yeah. So we went. Well, you picked to, the right sport. Yeah, it was neat. We <laughs> went to city hall, and the mayor got to read the letter from the governor general, which was cool. It was humbling, mm-hmm. and uh, brought the family along for us. Special day it was neat. Yeah. Not something that you're gonna do all the time. So. No. I can tell you're humble. You're uncomfortable with it, eh? You don't want the. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not man. that guy. That's okay. Uh, that's a tr- true cowboy. Yeah, just do my job. That's right. <laughs> no, fair enough. Okay, well, let's. Uh, I think we should we should get into your to your run last year. Yeah, you, yeah. You had an epic, epic run. So, <clears throat> why don't we start from the the start of the year and and uh, maybe what your aspirations were heading into 23 and. Yeah. Yeah. So our goal was our goal is always pretty simple. It's to try to peak around Calgary, which yeah. is the middle of the season, okay. and then try to win the world championship, which is obviously at the conclusion of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, but Grand Prairie's the kickoff show, and typically we don't come really cranked for it. I take a pretty passive approach in, in getting the horses in shape. So I'm trying to peak during the Stampede and Pinocchio Stampede where the the bigger dollars are up. Yep. Um, but we just... Everything came together. A lot of the older horses that I had took a step forward, and a lot of the new ones that I was training picked things up right away. And so it was cool. We, we, the, the championship in Grand Prairie is named after my grandfather, Ralph Egan, and I've never come close to winning it. I'm, I'm not even in the, in the picture come the final day. Right. So to win that with your, with your friends, family, school teachers, it's pretty sweet. It was pretty cool. So I'm going to take the same approach to training that we did last year and try to defend our title. So I wasn't expecting to do as well as we did there. It was a bit of a blessing, but it, mm-hmm. it's good to get the season off on the right foot. Sometimes when you have a bad first show, it's hard to get out of those early heats as the season progresses. Yeah. I like being hooked with faster guys. There's something to be said about being in a fast heat. It's just, I don't know what it is. It just seems to put everybody at their best. Yeah. Sometimes when you're in the earlier heats and things don't go well in the infield and you're behind a wall of wagons that aren't moving very fast, it can be a challenge, right? Yeah, for sure. So Grand Prairie definitely set the tone. Set the tone, and yeah. then so you, you so you take that one and uh, how's the partying after? 
T- time out though before we let's just not sell this short. So I'm in my backyard, <laughs> duck. I'm in my backyard, listen to this final. Yeah. Pay attention to all the races and love yeah, the guy. Yeah, your follower. Yep. Love the guy, yeah. my buddy. Sure. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's not leave how the season started and how that race was and and the penalties, Vigs, right? Because uh, listening to it in the backyard. Um, South of town here, it was just like, oh no, he's he's done, right? Yeah, I can, so, okay, I can touch on that. It's yeah. actually, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Good that. Catch Tommy, that's why you're here, pal. Yeah, yeah. That's why you're here. Um, so in the final heat, it's it's like a different energy sometimes, yeah. and the crowd can start yelling before the race starts, and that can set the horses off. So, and my good horses are very quirky, and typically the really good ones are. They've got their own personalities, like I said earlier. And when we pulled in for the race. I was on the far outside barrel, and by the time everybody else had pulled in, the crowd started to yell, mm. and my horses acted up responding to, because they're ready, they're sitting on go. They're chomping. And then people, and in Grand Prairie, we're really close to the crowd. Mm. In Stampede, the crowd's kind of further back. Further, and, yeah, maybe less of a distraction. Yeah, so these guys start screaming, and my horses all jump. Right. And that's a penalty. So I, I have... Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, a, a penalty for just... Like they off the line? Yeah. They jumped ahead. Okay. So my so back hub, point. my back wheel yeah. has got to be at least parallel with the the bottom barrel. Okay. Or I have a head start on everybody else. Mm-hmm. So when we pull into our barrels, we all got to be at least parallel to the bottom barrel. Yeah. And I wasn't because mine jumped way ahead and I couldn't get them back. So I was forced to pull out. Yeah, restart. And we all had to reset. So that's mm-hmm. a two second penalty on me. And in wagon racing, one second's like a lifetime. So now... 99% of the time, my race is already over before it's began. Sure. Because I'm running against three yeah, extremely toast. good fast wagons. That's why they're in the in the final, right? Mm-hmm. And when we went back in, we had nothing to lose because I knew we were up against the two-second penalty, which is a long distance. Yeah. And we went for broke, and it, everything clicked perfectly the second time we went in. So we're actually the first guys to ever outrun a two-second penalty in a dash-for-cash format. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so that was pretty sweet. It's like a, like a, what was that, to, like Chariots of Fire when the guy's like last place around and he was like way behind and just makes the big comeback. Yeah, and the thing about Grand Prairie is it's kind of like the mecca of wagon racing. A lot of drivers have come out of that town. Yeah. So the fans are really knowledgeable. Like at Stampede here, there's way more people, but nobody knows what they're really watching because yeah. they're all tourists. Yeah, they're tourists. And man. they don't know the rules, right? But in GP, they do, and... Everybody had kind of wrote me off before the the horn had actually blown because we had to reset and they knew it was my fault. Was yeah, and anybody who's betting on your... Or, uh, yeah, they're throwing their line, money they're away like, already. This guy's toast. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we won that race, mm-hmm. I knew we had something special cooking with that particular outfit of horses. There's a, They call it a 3-4 barrel team, a short barrel outfit. Yeah. And ours just got better every night there mm-hmm. and to outrun that penalty was pretty cool. And then I knew... We had something really cooking for the rest of the year. It's a hell of a start to the year. Yeah, like Not they even surprised me. Yeah. Because typically out of spring training, you kind of know what you got. Mm-hmm. But sometimes there's practice players and then there's game players. Oh, yeah. And my yeah. horse is just really stepped up when the limelight was on them. Just clicked. Yeah, it all clicked and they really meshed together. Mm. They just gelled, and then I left them together. I have never put another horse on that team. Sometimes guys interchange and... Mm-hmm. I've left them alone, and I plan on doing the same next year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good for you. And then, yeah, I was mentioning earlier before we uh, got off a little bit on a tangent, but, uh, yeah, and then, obviously, you, you get your big win. You know you're going to the next rodeo. You just blow your head off in the, in the barns after. Like, how? I mean, I've been to a couple of barn parties way back in the day. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, uh, when I was – Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've passed that stage a little bit as far as driving <laughs> goes. When I was out riding, they typically – Outriders are known for burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> yeah. But for me, this year, I didn't drink all summer. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, there so you go. Sometimes the sponsors want to rip it up when they come back, but I have enough mm-hmm. people, friends, family around, they can rip it up with them. Yeah, I just got to the point where you're there's so much work involved and you got to be yeah. sharp that I just decided, like, from now on, when I start training, it's, it's a sober train until... We either win something mm-hmm. halfway through the year, like we won Pinocchio. I s- celebrated a bit, and then it's back on the straight and narrow till yeah. the season's done. There you are. True professional, right? See? You're an athlete. Yeah. It wasn't always that way, but that's no. when I was losing. So the fact that uh, 
you figured it out. We straightened out and then we started having success. So I think it's no fluke. We're going to keep that up. Well, so it makes you a world champion, man. Coming from a guy drinking a wine on your well, podcast. Right we're now. on a podcast. We'll do whatever the hell we want in here. Probably need a top up. Yeah, there, let's actually. give her. Tommy, we, what do you got we, for Weird, us? weird. Hey, you don't booze and you do better, eh? Weird, weird concept. Well, I mean, I feel like we're all kind of always beating ourselves up about, uh, I should lay off. Uh, I'm, uh, I'll probably be better if I'm not on the sauce, but I mean, everyone, you got to enjoy life. Too. But you kind of said it, like it, it was always a bit of a cultural thing with cowboys and wagon racing. Like the parties at the barns were legendary oh, during sick. during the nineties. When I was a kid, I'd be running around there and my parents wouldn't know where I was. And there was a party everywhere. So like the yeah. sponsors really liked it. The advertisers had their own tents back then. Now it's changed drastically. Has it? Yeah. Oh Yeah drastically like it's a ghost town after the races and the work's done mm. yeah everybody has to filter over to the rangeland derby's advertising tent and that's where the sponsors can go to party and if any of the competitors want to go and see their sponsors they can do it there uh, so things have calmed down quite a bit mm. you but, got responsibilities to look after probably go over there and shake hands and that's about it but the ranchman's is still open they tell me <laughs> so a lot of the the boys head there after the races yeah for sure yeah the ranchman's well, that cut, they're done. Oh, no, they're, are they done? They they're were done. and they're back. They're, they're back. back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, great spot, especially at Stampede. But I mean, year round, the only true Western bar uh, kicking around in Calgary. The Ranchman's was always good because stellar. We would never get out of the barns till about midnight. So, what bars are you going to be able to get into after midnight on, during Stampede? None yeah. of them. None of them. But the yeah. thing about the ranchmen's, they were so good to the competitors. You mm. all could always get in, and if they had to kick somebody out, they would. They would. I think half the time they probably wanted to kick some of those people out anyways, right? <laughs> yeah, no question. No, they were always super good to the competitors. They were that one bar that was awesome. Now Cowboys mm. is kind of trying to take that over. I was going to say, if Cowboys, yeah, like I was about to, if Cowboys wasn't letting you guys in, I mean, you guys are literally the stars of the rodeo like yeah i don't know how they win. i don't know how they do it for everybody else but i was i ran a cowboys tarp two years ago right and they were awesome yeah. to deal with and they were really good to us and mm -hmm. a shoot pass nowadays is going for four or five thousand bucks four grand is that yeah. what it is four grand <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't even know if you can transfer like you get four names that you can use but i don't think you can cycle it around like it has to be one of those four names well, you can tell me anyway pretty sure at yeah, any rate cowboys big. is kind of picking up that and mm -hmm. i don't know i'm like i said i'm kind of removed from that now during during the races me and my wife kind of go back and watch replays until i fall asleep and then we do it all over again <laughs> <laughs> yeah well when does the uh bidding start for that i feel like we touched on it earlier but when does the bidding start for the tarps again april 11th at the big four yeah april 11th big yeah four. it's an okay. awesome event the yeah. stampede does a good job so they'll mm -hmm. have a cool band tommy might know who's playing but every year they have got a legit band and yeah there's a dinner involved and it's a good it's a good way for a company to get their name out there it's huge it's awesome it's for huge. clients mm -hmm. yeah so for us last year it was a blessing kma had our tarp and they were just awesome to deal with so Dean Cato runs KMA. He became yeah, one of my better friends. I know Cato, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that guy. So yeah. we had a wicked bond back at the barn. We've I've really dialed into a really good crew, and it's just a good atmosphere. And when you have good energy in the barn with the people, the horses will feed off that too. I really believe that. Yeah. you got to have good mojo and be positive, and the horses will be upbeat with you if you are. So yeah. you got to have the right people around that get competition and can pick you up when things mm -hmm. don't go your way because it's easy to get frustrated. And it's a long show, right? There's a lot of peaks and valleys in a 10-day event like mm -hmm. Stampede. So yeah. I try to surround myself with people that I know that are going to pick me up. I have a question for you on the sponsorship. I'll let you chip in here, Tommy. But yeah. I, have, I have a question at the end of your <laughs> of your season. Like, what if you – can you have a sponsor just say, no, you're ours again? Like, do you automatically try to bid every year for your tarp? Or is it – you have your sponsor, and then if he chooses to stay on year after year, yeah. how does that work? So, well, it depends if the venue goes to auction or not. So Grand Prairie, Pinocchio, Calgary Stampede are all auctions. Yeah. And they have to participate as everybody else that goes and gets a bid card, and mm -hmm. you got to compete against everybody else that wants to raise their hand for whatever respective driver they're interested in. The other seven venues are all sold privately. They're private. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. But the ones that have auctions they take 20% of whatever you sell for. Mm. So if I sell for 200000 at Calgary this year, 40 of it's going to the Stampede. Okay. Right? So anytime they provide an auction, there's a price of 
a 20% commission that comes with it. Admin fee. Admin. So an auction can be good or bad. Yeah. Right? If you already have a guy that you trust that is going to pay you what you want, you would like to avoid that 20%, but it's unavoidable if he wants Pinocchio, Grand Prairie, or Calgary, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes you're better off at the other shows. Make it, you'll make a little bit more money, even though they're smaller shows. Whatever they are willing to pay for you, you get to keep all of it, right? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. No, all I was going to say is yeah. we we need to go back to Pinocchio. That's all, because oh, yeah? there's a lot to talk about in Pinocchio. So yeah, yeah. That's let's the, let's let's go that's back. The one. Let's go back there. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. What's the yeah? What else? What else went down in Pinocchio? I feel like this or, is turning into a. Br- I don't want because I get my I lose a lot, but Pinocchio and Grand yeah. Prairie were easily our best shows. Okay. So the the, yeah. the cool part about Pinocchio, my grandfather's won it seven times. Yeah. So it's kind of been known as his show. That's his spot. And I know that, you you were pumping Pinocchio pretty hard before. Too. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome yeah. there. They yeah. yeah. That's where the Rodeo Hall of Fame is. They just again knowledgeable fans and good energy, mm-hmm. packed house. That's where you you want to compete, obviously. Yeah. Um, for us, we manage to win first every night, and that's a that's a six day event. Yeah. So that that was a sixty two year old record. Which was oh. pretty sweet. Mm. So when I was sitting in the chute, my favorite race of all time, when I was sitting in the chute to get onto the racetrack for the finals, you can kind of hear the announcer. Yeah. Like you can faintly hear him. And I had no idea about a record. I get really introverted halfway through the year. I'm not really talking to people. Or yeah. I watch my race replays and get do your, my job. and Get your vibe going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Les McIntyre was telling the history of this record. And a guy named Dale Flett had won five day monies in a row. Mm. And when he went for six, the guy that broke his streak was Ralph Vegan. Ah. So that just sent chills down my, I was so fired up to get out there. So I was on the four barrel, which is typically not a barrel you want in those big races. Mm-hmm. But like I told you earlier, we had an outfit that was really gelling on the four barrel. Yeah. So I actually chose the four barrel sitting first going into the final heat. I got to pick my barrel and 99% of the time the guy sitting in the first seat is going to pick barrel one and sometimes you just got to go with your instinct and your gut and things were clicking with that four barrel outfit so went against the analytics and went with what was hot yeah riding the hot hand Mm -hmm. yeah and the horses just went out and did what they had been doing all year just kicked ass and so we managed to get it so we got pinocchio and we got the 62 year old record which was pretty yeah Yeah. that's insane yeah it's yeah it's good good to have yeah tommy here because you know Humble, humble guy, humble champion. It's good. Yeah, and and Vegas, let's talk about um, when you weren't winning. This is this is a real cool story, actually. Yeah. We real real heartfelt story. When you weren't winning, um, what happened in Pinoca one day when you were kind of down down and out on your luck? Um, but s- someone came up and gave you one day at the. Uh, Stampede there. Can we touch on that? Yeah, it's like I said earlier, the fans have been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. So a, a lady come to my barn and she had purchased my grandfather's hat in a silent auction 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And like Tommy alluded to, I had had some bad luck the night before and yeah. now you're going into the Calgary Stampede on a low. So you're kind of like feeling like whatever, right? Mm. Yeah. And she was a lady that our family had Jim Cannon with years ago in GP and she brought my grandfather's hat and it was signed. Oh, crazy. I've thrown it on Tommy's head a few times when we're having a few drinks, but <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, yeah. Signed in pen, Ralph Vegan, and she gave it to me and it just, Oh wow. Yeah. It flipped my energy upside down. Sure. Sometimes yeah. you need a lift every once in a while. Yeah, we all do. It's long days. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of investment. So when you do have a bad run, you're like, you think it's the end of the world. And yeah. it's it's not like hockey when you have a bad shift you can get out there and yeah you just correct it next shift yeah. exactly mm-hmm. you have that opportunity to to fix the mistakes right away and mm-hmm. find a positive find and a positive. with wagon racing it's a long twenty four hours before you can go out there again only as good as your last ride yeah mm-hmm. and and when you're going into that stage of the season that's the most important time and when things start falling apart at Pinocchio it, it can unravel really quick mentally for you yeah. Oh, so that was a, that was a big one, and that 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 was the kickoff for the year, really, right? Pinocchio, Pinocchio's, Pinocchio's crucial. Like like I said, if you have a good Pinocchio, you go into Calgary feeling like you can beat anybody. Yeah, and you got to have that attitude, whether whether it's true or not, you need to believe it, mm-hmm. right? And you need to believe in the horses, and they need to believe it. So even if you're sitting low in the standings, if you can draw some positives out of Pinocchio heading into the Stampede, mm-hmm. it's it's huge. 
So it's huge. Yeah. yeah. Needed that for a momentum builder and confidence and hundred percent clicking, gelling, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I don't know. You're a phenomenal guy. I love the sport and, uh, I did, yeah. I'm happy we talked about uh, everything we did, like from the horses to to the to the money side and the sponsorship side, and uh, bringing attention to uh, the low purses, and and that brings me to you. You know, you have to. You're working also. You're not just a Chuck racer, but yeah. you also work. Um, you know, with sun sundown energy, and so what? Are you, uh, what are you doing over there, and what are you guys peddling? And I'm doing sales, so we're a pipeline years. facility construction company. Mm-hmm. So we do the mechanical end of things. Mm-hmm. So pipelining is pretty straightforward, in my opinion. You <laughs> dig a hole and you put the pipe in the ground and you weld yeah. it together, right? Yeah. So there's nothing. It's not rocket science. No, it's not. It's good. Well, you'd be in the wrong studio. We're not getting into rocket science. Yeah, I could. <laughs> it's nothing technical. But, yeah. uh, no, they've been good. They've been good Giving supporters it. of mine, so it's mm-hmm. nice because they keep me on salary year-round. So when I'm off, I try to incorporate as much sales at each event as possible. Like a lot of the guys that maybe maybe the odd superintendent that you have a hard time getting mm-hmm. getting a hold of during your, you know, your winter work. Yeah. If you offer them a, a four, four passes to the stampede for their family, lot, oftentimes they take it up. Yeah, that goes far. Yeah, yeah sure. so you can you know, build some mm-hmm. relationships that way. So it's been good for me in that respect. Mm-hmm. And the guys have been, they've kept me on and they've been supportive of my team and they buy my tarp at the Grand Prairie Stompede as well. So, oh, so shout out to Sundown, yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. Well, you gotta, gotta support. And I know even our, uh, my company, I'm uh, not just a professional podcaster, but uh, yeah, I work what? at Lo- Lo- Lone Star Directional, uh, but we do um, obviously directional work for downhole stuff. Gotta plug plug the company, you know. Yeah, high five in there. But no, we actually sponsor... Uh, a, a junior bull rider, and uh, his name is uh, Kalen Bissett uh, Lewandyke. He's a 15-year-old, and he actually made the World Juniors finals in Vegas last year. So um, maybe I can get him in here too. I, I Very cool. Spoken to the guy yet? But uh, it's pretty pretty cool. He's 15-year-old bull rider. I mean, fuck, I, it's amazing. Tommy, chime in. We got to um, we got to talk about the stampede, though. I know we're we're getting. Long and a tooth there now, uh, but we, we gotta, are yeah. Well, yeah. we're all over the place. But we got we're all over the place. But it, but it has some chronological order actually. I, I like the flow, but actually it's great. Um, <laughs> Thank honestly, you. Yeah, you guys are doing great. Um, I'm just sitting here. Yeah. Um, with with time to process, but let's talk about the stampede vegs and those that don't know the rule yeah. changes in the stampede and how uh, that kind of uh, mess messed up things this year. I remember it all so clearly. Um, when, when the storm when the storm rolled in, it was it was heartbreaking. Okay, yeah, yeah, rule changes. Yeah, I w- wasn't aware. Well, of Well, the biggest changes. thing was going from four wagons to three, four to three. Yeah, yeah. So I think what Tom's getting at is going into the f- the ninth night. Yeah, we were sitting third with a comfortable lead. Yeah. So we're down to you're only allowed three wagons per race, and so only the top three are going to make it. And we had a about a four second lead on fourth, mm-hmm. and. Mother Nature started to kick us in the ass, and I could see the clouds turning. And what happened was uh, uh, a guy that I love, Ross Knight, was running in race five, and it just started to rain, and he was the guy sitting in fourth behind me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so he runs on a dry track, and then the clouds come over top of Stampede Park and started to rain, and it rained, and then it hailed, and then it rained some more. And I was in heat nine, and by the time I got out there, like we were running in – like a soup kitchen. It was just soup. Yeah. Yeah. So he draw he knocked me out from third to fourth and he got his spot into the finals. And what Tom's getting at is normal years we would have still been in the final heat sitting in fourth. And since they went from four outriders to two and four wagons to three, we were on the outside looking in. Yeah. Right. Just strictly for stampede. Mm. And that's well, that's wagon racing, I suppose. Sometimes you're gonna be on the right end and sometimes you're gonna be on the wrong end. But yeah. That's outdoor Bob sliding's like that. Luge, skeleton. If it starts to snow, the guys that go last are you're that's, in for one, right? Yeah, you're in it. Yeah, and that's the nature of being in an outdoor sport and mm-hmm. chuck wagon racing's no different. It no. was unfortunate because at the time we felt like we had we had an outfit that we could win with off of any barrel. Yeah. And like I said earlier, a majority of guys are gonna pick the inside barrels. We happen to have an outside barrel that was really clicking, so I was just concerned about getting into the race. Mm. And when the rain hit, that kind of 
that kind of punched us in the teeth and yeah, kicked us kicking, out. Kicking the nuts. Yeah. And then you got to wait another year to come back. <laughs> so it's we've, unfortunate. yeah, we've had the stampede kind of, it felt like it was within our grasp in 2022 and 2023 and we didn't get it done. And a lot of that's on me because I took some penalties earlier in the week where the rain wouldn't have mattered. Right. So mm-hmm. I don't want to just blame the rain. Like some of it's my fault too. Yeah. So this year, like every year you let that, you know, slip through your grasp, your key horses get a little bit older, right? So the you're closer to yeah, pasture. So you to have speak. a window to win, right? Yeah. With your core. And then you either got to do two things. You either retool or rebuild. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> you try to retool on the fly, but sometimes that's easier said than done. Mm-hmm. So when you do have the outfits to win it, you got to take advantage of it while the window is open. So that's why it's so heartbreaking, right? I think mm-hmm. I've had enough alligator tears in my tack room after Stampede for the last few years. Hopefully <laughs> we can get shit done the right way this year. Yeah. Well, and it's, yeah, it's too bad about the rule changes, but it is, like I say, it's the biggest outdoor show on earth. There's so many eyes on it, right? Like, the, so <coughs> I, they're, they're, they're under the most scrutiny of any. For sure. As long right? as they don't go too far one way, because yeah. what happens is we start appeasing Everybody. the 1% mm-hmm. in society. And we do that way too much in this country. This I'm getting off topic. I don't want to go too political on you, but we should quit appeasing the one percenters. And what's wrong with appeasing the 99 percenters? Yeah. I pff, fully, fully uh, with you on that. That's when I bitch about it all the time in here. I, uh, we're emboldening the minority of voices in everything we do in sports and yeah. And yeah. I think that's a mistake it's because frustrating. yeah, the stampede has got so much tradition behind it and you know, it's so symbolic for Western heritage mm. and Western culture. Yeah. And the more we keep appeasing the 1% that are always going to make noise. And if it wasn't for, for this, it'd be for something else. Uh, we're going backwards. I think that we should focus on appeasing the majority, not the minority. With you. Yeah, full on. Keep keep it uh, as it should be. Beeks, where did the, the, the pink sunglasses there hold those up? Where, where did that whole concept come from? You're always rocking out with the pink sunglasses. Yeah, where- I had a pair for Kevin, too. Oh, yeah? What do we got? Are these blue blockers? Yeah, <laughs> so that's just a regular pair, but... What I started doing was driving in those, and then mm-hmm. people started asking me for pink sunglasses like I was giving them out or something. Oh. So I went to KMA, my advertiser, and I was like, this is a great idea for fans yeah, and just family, friends that want to come by and support. So we bought 2,000 pairs last season, and yeah. we put our name on it and KMA for, for a little plug. Not those particular ones. Oh, okay. I was going to bring you some too, damn it. I forgot. It's all good. Yeah. But this year, so we just gave those 2,000 pairs away just for people to wear and the make them feel part of the team. Make them feel, yeah. This year we bought 10,000 pairs and we're going to we're gonna sell them for 20 bucks a pair, but we're going to donate all the 100% of the proceeds to charity. Oh, wow. Awesome. So if That's we fantastic. can sell 10,000, we'd be doing really well. But mm-hmm. my wife is super excited to, to find some good causes and we're going to give 100% of it back. Good for you, man. Philanthropist. Okay. <laughs> yeah, give do, it back. Do what you can with what you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a hundred percent. The boys uh, call them. Uh, what's it? Les calls you the Rangeland Derby rock star. Is that right? Rangeland Derby rock star. Rangeland Derby rock star. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I went to be honest with you. I broke a pair in training one morning, yeah. and I was in a rush, and I went and got a pair of pink shades because. When you're buying from a gas station, yeah. Yeah, you just grab the shittiest the s- pair there. Selection's right? limited. Yeah. And so I was wearing those, and he thought it was by design. But from the eye in the sky, when he's calling the race, he got Rockstar out of it. So he nicknamed me <laughs> Rangeland Derby Rockstar, and it's stuck ever since. So <laughs> It's fun, right? Like, Les, I don't know how he does it. He does a good job. He's got to remember so many sayings on the track. He's got to call the race, and then he's got to plug the sponsors nonstop. Of course. Yeah, you have to. So yeah. now there's 27 wagons out there. He's got 27 different sponsors, and he's nicknaming everybody. And I don't know how he does it, but he <laughs> he's he's been an unreal ambassador for the sport of wagon racing. Oh, yeah. cool. He's uh, yeah, he's a hustler, a mover and shaker. Yeah, it's like I said, it's not a job for everybody, but he does a good he does good work. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, I don't know. Hey, man, I, we we covered a lot of, covered a lot of ground. Um, I think uh, you know from start to finish. I know we were kind of bouncing around, but that's the beauty of the beauty of the podcast. We, we get into all the stories. One hundred percent. Look, look forward to tracking you next year. See what what do you think next year? What what's your prediction next year? What I think you should come back for? to the barns and take in a night of the races with us. Oh, one of the- please, yeah, fuck yeah, in yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. The thing about this time of year is everybody is super optimistic. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the same goals and everybody's feeling really good about the new horses they purchased over the, the fall. And some of them have been training already. And if it's going good, everybody comes into Grand Prairie on a high and excited and fresh, right? Yeah. As the season wears on, yeah, it's a long grind, right? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of travel. Yeah. And then if you're not winning, it can turn into a bit of a grind. Oh, but sure. right now, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's ready to get going and we're no different. And we'll yeah. take off here in a couple of weeks and we'll start training and we'll be ready. And away you go. Away we go. Well, we'll uh, cut, cut, print, and edit this episode and pump it out there for all your fans and for any new fans that might want to follow you along next year. We're pretty excited, so I want to thank you, Chance. And Tommy uh, McCarthy, good pal. Uh, you got me hooked up with you here. Thanks, Tommy. Pleasure, guys. Thanks uh, for having me here today. Eh? Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate right on. it too, man. Okay, pal. We'll see you out there. Best of luck in 24. Thanks, buddy. Right on.